Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com. I'm super excited, especially excited today to be down in LA at Jim Henson's Creature Shop. I'm here with Peter Brook. He's the creative supervisor of the Creature Shop, and we're going to talk about puppets. Let's uh, let's start at the beginning. How were puppets made decades ago, and and, and animated? I mean, as you said, this is Jim Henson's Creature Shop, and of course, Jim back in the 50s was creating puppets out of fabric and foam and so on and so forth. And they were very basic in, in a way. They were hand puppets as opposed to marionettes. A marionette would be a string puppet and up until that time marionettes were often very popular. But the fundamental concept of using one's hand to open and close the puppet's mouth and in a sense give the whole puppet its motion, that still stands. You know, that's a, a tried and tested technique. And indeed the exterior might be a bit more sophisticated than back in the day. But, you know, essentially my hand is just operating the, um, the mouth and the orientation of the head. And mm -hmm. in this case, because he's a small guy, um, you know, my whole arm is actually uh, contributing to the motion of the body. And then these hands, uh, very much like Jim used on Kermit, are just rotted hands, you know. Right. The real breakthrough was simply the fact that he saw the opportunity to use the television screen as, if you will, the, the, the proscenium. Um, uh, like a theater space, yeah, yeah like a like a like a theater. He, he used that to his advantage, and he realized that that whatever we see through the TV uh, through the TV screen suddenly becomes what the viewer sees. He kind of revolutionized the the way that puppets were used within the television medium. And of course, everybody knows that Jim became one of the most successful puppeteers in history. Now, over the years, using the the fundamental concept of the hand operating the mouth. Um, We've, like I said before, we, we've, we've actually um, made advancements in the exterior of the, of the characters and also in the mechanical devices and, and things within the, the puppet's head or within its hands or what have you to make the character come to life. What, what you really want is a puppet to totally come alive and be its own character, its own personality. With a good puppeteer, you know, a puppet suddenly becomes another member of the cast, if you will. So it's different than just creating a scary monster that kind of goes, ah, you know, for a couple of shots in a movie. It's a performance. It, I mean, really, it really is. I mean, performance becomes the key element. As a matter of fact, when we're designing puppets, we, we're, we're always keeping in mind how the character is going to be performed mm. because if we create something that looks great but can't move great then unfortunately the illusion is not going to be very good. So what are the uh, technologies and what are the tools that you use to enable that performance? I mean there are different yeah. a wide range of puppets that you make yeah. here. There are hand puppets, there are all the way up to creature suits yeah. where the performer is actually inside yeah. uh, the suit. Can you talk about some of those processes? In the 70s through to, to the mid 80s um, lots of the functions like an eye blink or a brow moving or ear wiggle or whatever was created uh, essentially using a cable, very much like a bike cable. And it, you'd have a push-pull sort of situation and, and the, the, the cable would push and um, push a, a, a lever that would perhaps move the, blink the eyes. Yeah. Then you pull back and it pulls the lever and so on and so forth. Um, then, with the advent of radio control servos, which uh, at the time were just available in you know, hobby airplanes and so on and so forth, we, we used those. And that replaced, many, in many ways, the, the cable technology. Although sometimes we do use cables, there's a mm -hmm. there's definite application. So we used the servos. And then it became obvious that the, the next breakthrough would be to create a system that one person, one performer, one puppeteer, could operate all of the various servos and cables and, and, and so on and so forth that were let's say, in a puppet's head to create the expression. In the old days with cables, one person pushed a lever, and then another person pushed a lever, mm -hmm. and you could end up with maybe four or five or six or seven puppeteers who all had to choreograph their movements in sync with each other to create an expression. And you want a system that one person can do it. And we wanted something that one person could do to, to maximize the performance, if you will. So you think there's a real value oh, in a, yeah. being a single performer yeah. corresponding with a single Absolutely character? Absolutely there's a value, yeah. I mean, to really create a, a true performance, um, to have one puppeteer in charge of bringing one character to life was the goal. Mm. So technology helps us again in that regard because we were able to create a computer system that could operate all these servers anywhere 
from like 14 servers up to, you know, maybe in 30 or so. Is that servers. the kind of system that was used in like the Ninja Turtles movie, for That's example? Exactly. Ah. It, yeah. That was, in fact, we'd, we, were, we were working on something prior to that. And there was, um, um, actually, Brian Henson did a, the Storyteller Dog. And that was a very early um, version of what we ended up calling the performance control system. And then for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it was further developed so that the turtles could <laughs> talk, you know, and their lips could form the uh, shapes um, that were required for the illusion of speech. And again, you're, you're dealing with one, a one-on-one. -on -one. So one puppeteer um, was responsible for the, um, the faces of the, uh, of the turtles mm -hmm. in, in this instance. And, uh, and then there was an actor inside the suit who was right. doing the, the physical movements. Right. Then from, from that breakthrough, we started to explore the idea of bringing a digital character mm. to life using a similar kind of philosophy, if you will. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, here, I'll show you later, th th this is the current version of, the, uh, of our digital performance uh, system, which allows one puppeteer to operate um, and bring to life a, a character that wow. is just digital. And that, that has many, many applications, as you can imagine. Yeah, when we think of animation, uh, computer animation, yeah. for example, you have you know, all the way on one side where it's all done by by a, a computer yeah. programmer or an animator, yeah. you yeah. know, flipping switches and moving a, something yeah. on screen, yeah. and then there's like a hybrid performance capture with yeah. you know what people think is this mocap, mo maybe a performance yeah. with a yeah. person with you know those balls like, tracking legs, right? Right. right. Um, but you're doing something almost on the other side of that where it's the end result is still a digital character, mm -hmm. but it's the puppeteer, the traditional puppeteer's movements. Correct. That you're putting yeah. on, that, on screen, that you're translating. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, there's no animation as such, mm -hmm. and no traditional animation as such. The, the, the movements, um, as you quite rightly said, are, are a combination of mocap and, and using our performance system uh -huh. here. One of the things that is different between this and, say, normal digital animation is what you see here is what you get. And because it's done real time, there's a certain, there's a certain amount of rendering which can't happen in real mm -hmm. time, you know. So to do something absolutely photorealistic is going to be is going to be tricky at this point in time mm -hmm. a few years from now I think we'll we'll be able to do it but um, basically we've got a character that exists completely in the digital world this this is a digital version of Rigel from Farscape and then this in its essence was the kind of contraption if you will that we would use in the old days to operate the Teenage Turtles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I could, um, you know, I could, you, I could designate this motion, for example, to be an eye blink or a mouth movement. In this case, that movement there is top and mm -hmm. bottom lip, you see? Yeah. But then just like a real puppet or a traditional puppet, should I say, if I open and close my hand like this, it opens and closes the the digital character's mouth. And then on this hand, I have a, a joystick kind of contraption, which in this case operates the eyes. Ah, there's your thumbstick right there. The thumbstick right. is operating the eyes, up and down, left and right, so on and so forth. Then this button here is operating the eye blink of the character. And there's you just have analog controls throughout. Basically. So many axes of movement. Yeah. But a good puppeteer is, you know, is able to really bring this thing to life. And then, of course, you've got the advantage of the puppeteer supplying the voice as well. Ah. So you've got the whole package. In real time? In real time, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Wow. Yeah. And so this is the type of thing where if you take it to an event, a digital character um, can interact with an audience. Well, exactly. And that's a, that's a, a, you're absolutely right. That's an application that we've used before. Like in a, in a convention type of situation or something, you'll see the character on a screen and... I mean, quite honestly, we just have a hidden camera so that the puppeteer who's behind the curtain, if you will, um, can see um, um, an image of the uh, audience mm -hmm. as well as seeing an image of what he or she is um, puppeteering. Over the past 20 years, as you can imagine, that technology has really meant that, that digital or computer graphic effects, particularly in the movies, have got to such a, a high level of realism that it's very difficult to compete with that. But 
Um, in other areas, like you mentioned, um, live events, well, we've done uh, theatrical events and musical events and so on and so forth, whereby the spectacle of having a physical creature in the space, or in this case on, on, a, on a stage, um, is something that, 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 that a digital character can't compete with in terms of uh, the, um, you know, how cool the, the effect is, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, you know, the, the digital characters are always, especially in a live situation, are always within a screen. Um, but something like, like these fantastical, these are from Dark Crystal actually, but something like this can you know, like walk into a space. And yes, that's right. And be yeah. amongst us. And that's the magic. Yeah. That's the magic that you guys bring. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I think the audience, uh, the general public, um, I think we really like to see, particularly on the screen, but certainly in, in, in person, we like to s see high degrees of craft, if you will, and art. Um, I mean, this is absolutely gorgeous to look at, and the level of detail on the costume is, is tremendous. And, and we respond to that on a subconscious human level, you know. If it's digital, um, I think sometimes subconsciously we have a hard time believing it's even there, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at your shop, you guys have a wonderful shop. You always <laughs> have these huge projects. I mean, so much fabric and foam yeah. and materials. It really reminds me of, you know, a fabrication shop and a effects company. Sure, you know, which, is, the, which is kind of what we are. Yeah. Right, yeah. you're sculpting, yeah. Yeah. And whether it's foam or clay, you're yeah. mold making, yeah. and there's a machine shop, a beautiful machine shop, an yeah. animatronic shop yeah. with a lot of different technologies. I see you know, RC hobbyists, controller yep. transmitters and controllers, yep. Yep. Um, and I'm sure you're experimenting with new materials all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the things that you as a company, and Jim Henson, the Creature Shop as a company, look to in terms of making puppets and, and helping bring performances to life with technologies? Well, I mean, we keep our eyes and ears open all the time, and we're open to using anything that will work, quite frankly. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things about working in this field is is that we're often asked to do things, to create things that have never been seen before. So sometimes you just have to think outside the box, and that's really what being creative is. You know, um, you you have you will try things. We'll um, you know we have a, a, an animatronic expert, John Criswell, who's just a, a real genius when it comes to mechanical things. And I mean, he's always keeping his eyes and ears open for little devices and and um, techniques that he may be able to adapt to use in a creature or a, or a puppet, mm -hmm. something like I that. See. So you guys have a 3D printer? A 3D printer, exactly. We use a 3D printer in certain instances to print out parts for a variety of reasons. One is the, the, uh, the part itself, if it's a complicated thing, we can print it out and it's, it ends up being very light. Mm. Um, for example, I mean, look, here's, a, here's just an eyelid application. Yeah. That, that we did, it, it, it was for a character that's got a very large eye. This kind of gives you an idea of the mm -hmm. diameter of what the eye would be. And it also had to be very durable. So rather than sculpt the eyelid with the texture on it and uh, go through the molding process and so on and so forth, this was just drawn in, in the computer, um, ZBrush or something like that, and, um, and then printed out. And we ended up with a very lightweight very durable um, eye. But I mean, the advantage of a 3D printer is that we can print as many of these out yes, as right, we would like. Right. You know, I mean, in this instance, I think we printed, there was two um, versions of it, so we ended up printing four eyelids. And it's a production unit. This is actually put into mm. the field. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, this, 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 is, this ended up in the, uh, in the costume, actually. Yeah. Wow. Um, one of the movies I want to talk to you about uh, that you worked on is A World of Wild Things Are, which, oh, yeah. which I love the film, yeah. and it seemed like it had a great combination of the, the practical suit building and creature building, but also integrated some uh, digital techniques. Yeah, no, I, I agree. A, a, a great film. And, and I mean, again, fundamentally, the decisions were made to maximize the performance. One of the things that Spike Jones, who's a director of that movie, um, one of the things that Spike was really um, adamant about was that he wanted to create an environment so that the kid who played Max could act in a very believable way. And so Spike wanted to use practical costumes as the wild things so that there was no ambiguity, that, that the, the, uh, the kid was not going to be acting um, on a, on a forest set with, a, say, a green tennis ball right. or, or even a person in a green mocap suit or something right. like that. The, he really wanted this sense that these 
big wild things were running through the forest and interacting with Max. Um, and he wanted to see this all on film. In a sense, creating as real as possible the, the story, you know, creating a kid with a bunch of wild things. Um, so we made practical costumes, which were successful, but the, the level of um, emotions that were required in, within the face um, dictated that, that they used, um, uh, in a sense, digital animation mm -hmm. to do the expressions mm -hmm. of the faces. But that marriage between practical effects and digital effects it, in this film, I think, was highly successful. Um, and Spike was able to create wild things that were real, if right. you will, and, and they, they're totally believable. You know, you've got the, 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 literal, call, the, the literal physicality of the furry wild things, and then you've got the, the wonderful um, range of expressions, which quite frankly is only possible using a digital technology. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, you know, there was a sense, uh, certainly in my mind, of like, well, boy, what the heck am I going to be doing because uh, computer graphics are going to take over and just dominate yeah. the market to the point where none of this will be relevant. But actually, we found that, that this still remains relevant and, um, and people still want to see. Yeah, you st started with dinosaurs, but still, yeah. still not extinct and looking forward. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Exactly. Thank you so much, Peter, for, oh, for chatting with me about puppeteering, about puppet making, and about some of the things you guys are doing here welcome. at the Creature Shop, Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Um, we'll have more stuff on the website, on tested.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Norm, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Peter. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to meet you.